Good afternoon. My name is Bill Keeler, and I am the host of our Friday Technology Edition of Military Trailblazer Office Hours. I'd like to welcome everybody who's joined us today, especially those of you who are joining us for the first time. Uh, the primary mission of Military Trailblazer Office Hours is to provide a live forum for transitioning military, veterans, their spouses, and allies to ask questions and get help while on their Salesforce learning journey. So besides answering your questions and providing help where we can, we also invite industry leaders, Salesforce MVPs, ISV partners, and others to speak and provide insights into various parts of the Salesforce platform and ecosystem. So before we open it up today for questions, uh, there's one topic that we're gonna focus on and that is Salesforce platform events. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna remove the spotlight from myself here and I'm gonna share my screen. And what I would like to do is walk you through just a very quick uh, demonstration of Salesforce platform events so that you can get an idea of what they are, how they work, uh, and how you might you know, start to get some ideas about how you might use them within your uh, Salesforce environments that you manage. Uh, so very quick, uh, quick question. Has anybody here used Salesforce platform events uh, in, their, you know, in their own Salesforce orgs? I kind of find it's one of these things that not a lot of folks are familiar with. Um, and, I, and I think if, uh, you know, once, uh, you know, people get an idea of what they are and how they can be used, I think it's uh, something that you can probably find a lot of use cases for. Um, so just a very high level, right? So Salesforce platform events, uh, they are a special kind of Salesforce uh, entity. Think of it that way, just like almost like a Salesforce custom object. Uh, the main difference is uh, they're write only. You can only create them. You can't edit them or delete them. So you can write them. Uh, you can't query them. You can't bring them up in the Salesforce UI. Um, but what you can do is you can write them to the database and you can subscribe to them, right? So you can publish them, in other words, create them. Uh, and then you can have various things that can actually subscribe to them so that when uh, an event, a platform event is created, they can take action on that, right? Now, there's a lot of different use cases where you might want to do this. Um, and a lot of them have to do with integrations to external systems. But what I'm going to do here today is I'm going to focus on a use case that is inside of Salesforce. So we're going to publish an event from inside of Salesforce, and then we're going to subscribe to the event from within inside of Salesforce. And I'll tell you about some of the benefits of why you might even want to do that. So like I said, we're going to start off with a very simple example. Uh, so let me share my screen and kind of show you what we're talking about here. All right. So in the example here, and uh, let me make this full screen. There we go. Okay, so in this example that I'm going to walk you through, just so we can start to get, work with platform events and you know see how they how they operate, um, we're going to have an account object, uh, an account record, and whenever an account record is updated, and in our example, I, I was going to start out with type, but we're actually going to go with uh, just a billing street, just to make it easy. So every every time you have an account where the billing street is updated, we want to update all the related contact records and update their other street. Right, so there, there's an other address field on the contact. Um, so essentially, we want to create an or edit an account, update the address, and we want that to trigger an action where all the related contact addresses are updated. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, well, I mean, why do I need platform events? I could do that with a flow, right? We can have a record triggered flow and account. Uh, you know, we can have a decision block in there that says, you know, when this um, you know address has changed you know, get all the related uh, contact records and update them or just put an update element right on your flow uh, that'll update all those related contacts. And the main reason why you might not wanna do that is this is just one little piece of your automation, just trying to update these uh, contact uh, addresses. Well, let's just say you have all kinds of flow and process builders and workflows and all these things that are running on account. Uh, when you click that save button on the account, all those updates are happening within the same transaction. And in most cases, there's some exceptions to that, but in most cases, they're all trying to run within the same transaction. And Salesforce has limits to how much you can do within that one transaction. So the benefits of platform events, uh, if I go back to not full screen, uh, the benefits of platform events is that it, it uses the Salesforce event bus and these are asynchronous, right? So what'll happen is, if you have an account update, which we'll consider as an event producer, um, you record a platform event and you can have one or more consumers or subscribers to that event that when an event gets created, they can pick it up and do some action. The really cool thing is that every time they pick it up and do some kind of action, um, it's handled in its own separate transaction, right? So you think about all that stuff you have running on your account object when you make that, that record update, um, this every little piece of that or pieces of that 
uh, you can have it where they subscribe to the event and they'll get processed independently from everything else, right? So what I want to do is I'm going to I'm going to go through an example where you know we're going to create the platform event, uh, we're going to create a flow in the account so that we can actually publish an event, and then we'll create that flow in the contact where we, su we can subscribe to it. Before I do that, though, any initial questions just right off the bat as far as what platform events are, why we might use them, um, or anything there before we jump into it? All right, hearing none. Um, I am going to, all right, so let's jump into our org. All right, so what I did was uh, we have a, a brand new hands-on org through Trailhead. So there's nothing special here. It's not a you know special kind of org, just a standard org. Uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to setup and we're gonna go to platform events. All right, so over in the quick find here, I'm gonna search for platform event and click right here. And you'll see in this environment, uh, I have one created already and that's for a uh, you know more advanced example, which we'll get to in a little bit. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click create platform event. And this might look very familiar. It looks kind of like the, the record or the uh, object creation when you create a custom object. So very similar to that, we're gonna give it a name. And in this case, we're gonna call it uh, you know account, uh, account update, keep it simple, right? And uh, account updates as the plural label. Uh, and then you get this uh, question here. So when do you wanna publish the event? Do you wanna publish it after the commit or publish immediately? So basically what this means is, let's just say that we have a flow on the account object and at part of that flow, we're gonna try to publish a platform event. What this says is that, you know, if you set it to publish immediately, as soon as you hit that element in your flow, it's gonna publish the event, it's gonna go out. Now, if somewhere later in that flow, you have a failure, something fails and that transaction's rolled back, if you were to publish this event immediately, that it's still got logged and everything that's subscribing to that will, will continue to go, uh, process and it'll, you know, all your subscribers will pick that up. So in most cases, and of course, again, there's always exceptions to this, but I think in most cases, you're gonna wanna have publish after commit, which means that even if you hit that line in your flow and keep on going, it's gonna wait for that full transaction to commit and be successful before it actually puts it up on the event bus. All right, so subscribers can pick it up. So that's what we're gonna pick in our case here. All right, I'm gonna pick uh, publish after commit. Uh, and of course, I don't know anybody that's ever selected in development. So we're gonna go with deployed. All right, so I'll click that. Uh, and that creates our basic platform event. Now, just like a custom object, we can, we can define custom fields for our platform event. So what I'm gonna do in this case, again, trying to keep this as simple as possible for this initial example, I'm gonna create a single field on our new uh, event and it's gonna be of type text. And this is just gonna represent the account ID. All right, so I'm gonna give it a label of account ID. Uh, length should never be more than 18 characters. Uh, and we'll make that required. All right, so that's it. So we just created one custom field that's gonna hold our account ID. All right, so just by creating this platform event, it's not gonna do anything. Nothing has happened here. Uh, there's no publishers, no subscribers. So that's what we're gonna do now. Let's, let's actually create the first publisher in other words, the first way that we can actually create one of these events. Um, and if you uh, recall from our example, uh, the publisher in our very simple basic example is gonna be the account object. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back to uh, set up here. And you know what I'll do? I'll leave this up here in case uh, we have to come back to it. So I'll duplicate this. And then what we'll do is we'll go to our flow. All right, we're gonna create a new flow on our account object. So this flow is basically going to detect when a change has happened on the account uh, for the account address. So we're gonna make this a record triggered flow. Um, and we're gonna say that this is when, only when it's updated, uh, and this is gonna run on the account object. So when an account is updated, um, and we can even throw in here a condition where the billing street has changed, because again, that's our very basic example. So we'll say is changed true. All right, uh, and every time the record is updated to meet this condition, and we'll keep this on actions of related records. So that's it. So basically, very basic record triggered flow uh, that's running on the account object. And our only criteria that we set here is when the billing street is changed, okay? So when that happens, we want to publish one of our uh, platform events. Now, this is gonna look very familiar, uh, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna select create records, okay? And we're gonna say, I'm gonna call this uh, publish platform event. All right, so we're gonna create one record 
and we're going to use separate resources and literal values. So I'll click on that. And the type of record that we want to create, uh, you'll see here, is the account update. Now, one thing that you should notice here is that when you have a custom object that you try to create within a flow, you'll notice the API name would have an underscore underscore C. In the case of a platform event, that platform event slash object is going to have that uh, suffix of underscore underscore E. Okay, so I'm going to select that. Uh, and again, in our basic example, there's only one field that we're going to populate, and that's going to be the account ID. Uh, and if you remember, since this is a record triggered flow and account, we can get to that account ID by using that dollar sign record variable that's in here that represents the account that triggered this flow. So we'll select that, uh, and then we'll scroll down here to ID, and that's it. So I'll click done. All right. So again, super simple example, but in this case, whenever an account is updated, and whenever we uh, change that billing street, that's going to cause us to create one of our platform events. All right. So I'm going to save this real quick, um, and we'll call this, uh, you know, account billing street updated, and that's it. All right, so I'm going to activate this. Now, again, we uh, we created our platform event, and now we have a publish mechanism set up so that when our account changes, we're going to publish one of those platform events. Well, what you'll notice is that if we were to go back to account and start changing a bunch of billing streets, it's going to publish the events, but we have nobody listening right now. So essentially, we're, we're kind of shouting into the void, but nobody's actually picking that up. So that's going to be the next thing that we do here. We're going to create uh, something that's listening for one of these platform events. So just to kind of show you, uh, before we do that, you know, I always like to do the negative uh, use case here. So if we were to go into our details and I were to edit my uh, billing address here for the Burlington Textiles account, if I were to change that from Lexington Avenue to Concord Street, all right, and save that, um, it's going to fire a platform event. That's going to get logged up to the event bus. But if we were to look into one of our contact records, uh, it's not actually going to create, it's not going to update their their other address. Right now, that's still blank. Okay. So again, we've published what we haven't subscribed yet. So that's what we're going to do now. So I'm going to create a new flow. And in this case, uh, this is going to be a new type of flow that I don't think that we've ever spoken about. And this is a platform event triggered flow. All right. So we'll select that and create. Uh, and it's going to say choose platform event. So in our case, it's going to be real simple. We have one, the account update. Now, something just to keep in the back of your mind, you notice that we only have one platform event that we created. Actually, two. I created the update account, and we already had this one here that we'll talk about later. But there's a whole bunch of other stuff in here, right? So something to think about, there's, there's other platform uh, activities that are occurring that are actually logging platform events that you could, in theory, subscribe to and do various things with. So for example... If a batch job status changed, it's logging a platform event. You might create a flow that if that status changed to failed, have that email one of your system administrators or log it to Slack or something like that. So something to kind of come in here and take a look at to see all these other types of events that might be available for you to look, uh, you know, to subscribe to. Uh, but again, in our case, let's go with our account update. That's it. So um, when a platform event of account update is logged, what we want to do is, well, first thing, we have the account ID, but now we need to get the actual account because we need to be able to grab the addresses and things from that. So we'll do a get records and we'll say uh, get uh, account that fired this event. All right. And that's going to be, of course, of the uh, account object. And we want to get all the accounts where the account ID is equal to uh, the the account ID that we put on the platform event. And in this case, because this is a platform event triggered flow, the dollar sign record variable that we have represents that platform event that we logged. So we'll click that. Uh, and then that gives us access to that account ID that we created. All right. Uh, and of course, you know, we only need to get one account because there will only ever be one account that has that ID equal to that account ID. All right. So that's it. Uh, so Finally, you know, we, we updated the account billing street. Now we want to make sure that all the uh, contacts have that. What I'm going to do is just do a single update records here, and we'll say update um, other streets on related contacts. Okay, uh, we'll specify conditions. So we want to find all contacts. 
having trouble typing today. All right, so we want to find all contacts where the account ID is equal to, and of course, uh, same thing here, the account ID that we logged on our platform event. And when we find those contacts, what we want to do is set the other street equal to our street from our account. And of course, we got our account in the previous step, so we can select that, and then we can grab that uh, billing street from here. Okay, so that's it. So uh, whenever a platform event is logged of this type, we're gonna get the account related to uh, that platform event, and then we're gonna update all of our contacts with that you know, billing street, put it into the other street field. So let's save this, and we'll call this uh, contact other street subscriber flow. I don't know, we can, we can rename these things later. All right, so I'll save that, and we'll activate this. Now, in theory, if we if we kind of think if we jump back to this, um, we have our event producer, which is our account flow, which when an account uh, billing street changes, we're going to log a platform event. So that gets logged onto the event bus as a, that account update platform event. And then we now just created a subscriber so that when that platform event happens, um, we are going to do some action. In our case, we're going to update all the related contact uh, other streets related to that billing street. All right, so to see this in practice, if we go back here to our Burlington textiles uh, and we go to our address, I'm gonna edit this one more time and set a Concord Street. Uh, we'll make this uh, Washington Lane. All right, and I'll save that. Now, what I would expect now is because we updated the building street on the account, that would have created a platform event. Our other flow would have picked that up and would have updated all the related contact addresses as well on the other street. So if we go to this, uh, you can now see that that other street got updated uh, based on our, our subscription flow. All right. So yeah, so that's a, that's a very basic example of how you can create a platform event, how you can publish you know, to that event, and then how you can create a subscription to that. Now, before we open it up to questions, I just want to kind of speak to uh, and you know other use cases where this might be relevant, uh, excluding you know all the ones we talked about with like external, uh, where you're trying to connect to an external system. But maybe another example uh, for internal. Let's just say that you created a, or you have a management that wants to be notified whenever a key event happens, like something significant. They want to make sure that all the the partners of the company are notified. Uh, so what you might do is you might say, okay, you know, we're gonna we have our opportunity flow, and whenever we have an opportunity that gets created that has an amount greater than one million dollars, um, we want to send an email to all the business partners. They want to be notified of that, all right? So you create your opportunity flow to do that, um, and then also maybe contracts. Uh, whenever a contract closes that is greater than you know. Uh, $750,000, you want to notify all those business partners as well. And same thing, right? So whenever you start to get these kind of key events, you know, you're creating all these various flows on those objects to send those uh, emails. Now, if at some point in the future, let's just say, uh, you know, the business partner, one of them attended Dreamforce last year, and he just determined that Slack is the new greatest thing in the world. He says, in addition to, you know, wanting to receive an email on these key events, I also want to start to receive Slack notifications in a certain channel, like our partners channel. So if you had created these all as separate flows, you would have to go back into each and every one of those and add that additional functionality to, you know, send that message to Slack. Again, not a huge problem, but you can imagine, you know, if we have four here, you can imagine some companies have, you know, 15 of these things, right? So every time they come back and say, you know, not only do we want email, but we want Slack. Not only do we want Slack, but we want to add, you know, some new audit table or, uh, you know, key events, you know, table that we want to log to that we can run reports on during our weekly meeting. Uh, whatever it is, you'd have to go back in each one of these to do that. Now, think about a different model where all we're doing is in each one of our flows, we're saying that a key event has happened. So we might record that information to a platform event. Um, and we make our platform event generic enough that we can keep track of what's the record ID that fired it, what type of event is it? So you can, you know, say it's a, a high value opportunity, it's a new cool lead, it's a high value contract, whatever it is, you can put that into a type field. And then you can have a detail section where you put whatever text that you would like in there. And then on the subscription side, we have a single subscription that subscribes to that platform event that handles the sending the email, the logging into an audit table or sending it to Slack, 
uh, all in one place. So if you needed to make updates or you needed to refine that process, you would have one place to do that instead of having to go to each one of your individual flows to do that. So again, basic example, but you can start to get an idea of you know where in your logic you might want to start decoupling things. So you're not trying to build all that logic into that one synchronous transaction. You might want to you know separate it out so that it just gets handled as a separate asynchronous transaction. So with that, let me stop my share. Um, any questions or anything you, you want to go through in more detail around platform events? Hey Bill. So with those platform event triggers, so you're saying that doesn't, like that's not a DML, DML statement. Is that what kind of whole advantage is? Or? Yeah, so the, the main advantage now, whether creating a platform event is actually treated as a DML uh, action as far as like limits and things are concerned, I'm actually not sure. I can look into that. But the main benefit is that the when you think about the two things that have to happen, um, you know, logging the event and then all the stuff that has to happen related to that event. Um, if you were to try to build that all into your one flow, all that stuff happening within one transaction, you might hit, you know, the number of elements in a flow limit, or you might hit, you know, CPU timeout limits, or to your point, maybe you hit the number of DML, uh, you know, limits within a, a single transaction. So what this allows you to do is in that, that first transaction, you just log the platform event, and then all those little bits of logic that you would have to do that all together might throw you over some limits or wouldn't be scalable, you can break them up into individual subscriptions that can handle that event within their own transaction. So that's really the main benefit I see as the, you know, the maybe the you would call it like the platform, the platform model. So you're not talking about external systems, it's just stuff happening within Salesforce. Um, that to me is the biggest benefit is that you can have each of those, you know, mini things happening within their own transactions so that if one of them fails, it doesn't fail all the other ones. Um, you know, if one of them is, or multi, you know, together they add up to, they'll put you over to certain limits, you know, individually though, they might all be under the limits. You know, that's really the main benefit, I think is that asynchronous nature of that event bus and that subscription. All right, thanks for that. Really good presentation, by the way. So yeah, well prepared. Yeah, really thank you. You know, there's, uh, there's some other kind of cool things here, uh, which is kind of out of the scope, I think, you know, when we talk about like the entry level, uh, you know, just getting an idea of what platform events are and how they work. But when you talk about external systems, uh, there's a lot of functionality that's built into this, uh, you know, the platform events themselves, where let's just say that you have, um, uh, let's say an accounting system. So anytime that you have a contract that gets closed one or an opportunity to close one, you're going to send something to your external system, you know, for accounting. Now, let's just say that system is down for, you know, half a day, right? So all these things, all these platform events were logged and they weren't being sent to that external system. So they have no record of anything that happened within that half a day. There's functionality within platform events where that system can say, the last event that I saw was, you know, this specific ID. And then it, it can actually replay all the events that have happened since then. So there's a lot of this kind of retry, uh, rehandling uh, functionality built into the platform. Uh, for, specifically, you know, you think of that use case where external system might be down or for whatever reason couldn't get the, you know, couldn't get those events. So yeah, there's there's a whole other thing that we talk about with external systems and integrations um, that again is beyond my skill set and also kind of beyond the scope of a, uh, a simple use case here. So. Uh, yeah, any other questions, comments, Bill, concerns? This yeah, is Greg. Greg. Uh, I didn't design it, but our system uh, has an event trigger. And inside the trigger, we create a message log so that we store all the, the critical data uh, just for logging, because then we can query the log, whereas the event, you can't query. And I thought I found that very useful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's uh, that, that's that's a great uh, point there. Um, one thing that you know, when I started going through platform events, trying to you know not only just learn the functionality, how I could try to explain it, all that kind of stuff, um, I immediately went to how can I start implementing this as part of uh, my product, right? So a managed package that we have on the App Exchange called Resource Hero, um, and one of the things that I thought was pretty compelling 
we have a lot of code that's built into our application uh, specifically for error logging and error handling and things like that, uh, that has absolutely no use to the customer when things are going well, but is absolutely critical for me when we're trying to troubleshoot, you know, when something is not working, right? Now, that troubleshooting information, if we already have very large transactions happening, we're, we're saving lots of data, we have a lot of stuff happening in that transaction where, you know, we don't want to hit those CPU limits, I don't want to put any more CPU time or any more limit, limits into logging uh, debug information uh, that might actually, you know, if that debug information puts us over the limit, now it's going to fail the customer's actual transaction. So I thought that, you know, that error handling piece um, is actually a great use case for platform events in that I create the platform event. I can have a trigger on that that actually logs it to a debug table or to a, you know, a, a, you know some type of debug log table. Um, and then, of course, you know, because it's handling it through the platform event, it's completely decoupled from anything that's actual customer facing customer transaction. Um, and of course, at, you know, this call is being recorded for quality assurance and training purposes. I shouldn't say this, but one thing with Salesforce, you know, a lot of times, I guess it's any technology, and let's be fair, um, there's always great functionality and you get really excited. And then there's that one detail that you're like, ah, oh, come on. So I was, I was getting ready to actually start building this into my application. I was going to start using it, pushing it out to my customers, but platform events will not work. And I think I'm going to saw a comment in the, in the chat here too, but platform events will not work in group edition or professional edition. So if I were to put this in my managed package and you try to install this into it as, you know, a customer org that's either group or professional, uh, the installation would fail. So I am personally going to hold off on using platform events until they're supported on all editions of Salesforce. But, um, you know, if you're managing uh, a company, internal company, your internal Salesforce org, you know, for your business, I think uh, it's a great piece of functionality if you're above professional edition. So, yeah, uh, any other questions then? on platform events or anything that uh, you'd like me to rehash or go into more detail on? Hey Bill, this is Steve. I got uh, two items here. One is, yeah. first of all, thank you very much for going over this because this is something that I've never really understood. I haven't seen, they're probably out there, but I have not seen any trailhead modules on. Um, so yeah, this is, I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. Second yeah. of all, I was curious about um, what you use to document these flows where you're showing us the, um, um, the structure and so forth, because it's a really clean interface. And I really like that a lot. I was wondering what you use. Yeah, let me, uh, let me show you that. So two things here, um, actually three things here. Um, I'm going to show you, or I'm going to drop links here for this copy link address. Okay. So in the chat here, uh, this is the, trailhead module for platform event basics. Um, if you are having trouble sleeping, this is the platform events developer guide. So you can read through that at your leisure. Um, and then to answer your actual question, uh, if I share my screen here, what I was using to document this is uh, Lucidchart. Uh, and from what I understand, I think they still have a uh, free edition to this that you can sign up for uh, but yeah, pretty slick. The nice thing about this is when you're documenting, um, here, let me see if I get you a better, uh, let's see. So if I go back here, let me show you one of my other diagrams here. Mm, yeah, let's look at this one. Okay, yeah, so really cool thing, uh, to your point, very clean interface uh, for you know documenting and diagramming uh, things. Um, and what I was about to say is that the nice part is Salesforce has a bunch of cards and stuff that are pre-built for you that you can leverage that have, you know, all the different, uh, what's this here? So the product logos, they have product icons, they got the industry icons and a whole bunch of other stuff um, that you can leverage that Salesforce has put together. Um, the other really cool thing is Lucidchart, you know, you can, you can get started, you can build a diagram from scratch or use templates. Uh, but specifically around templates, if I were to go to, here, let's go to... Uh, architect.salesforce.com. And if you go to the, uh, I always get lost here. Uh, it would be under the design and then reference architecture gallery, right? So they have a lot of these things pre-built. Uh, so you think about like the sales cloud data model, right? So if you, if you wanted to, you know, have all the relationships of all the objects in Salesforce around sales cloud, um, not only can you see that here and download it as a PDF file, but you can actually open it up in Lucidchart 
uh, and then start you know adding your own functionality and your own custom objects in there and you know showing them as a diagram. So yeah, Lucid Chart. That's uh, I've been finding a lot of use in that uh, specifically around development and, and documenting you know our our uh, all the objects and the inner inner relations between the objects you know for our managed package, but pretty slick. So yeah. Awesome. Thank you very much. Yeah, and that architect. So, like I said, that's a that's a pretty good one uh, for all the kind of pre-built diagrams. It even goes through the, you know, the details about uh, diagrams with levels. So you start with like a level one, which is very high level. You know, talking you know, twenty thousand foot view. And then you got level two, three, four, with level four being the most detailed, like down into the database uh, type uh, diagrams. So really good, really good reference. And as I say that, let me put that into. The chat as well. So architect.salesforce.com. Relatively new site, but pretty, pretty slick. So all right. Um, any other questions on platform events or before uh, we just kind of open it up in general? Okay. Uh, well, what I'll do this presentation or this recording, I'll put this up onto YouTube uh, shortly after uh, we hang up here at one o'clock. But uh, for now, uh, platform events, uh, you know, we'll, we'll set that off to the side. Does anybody have any questions on anything else or any other topics uh, they might want to go through or discuss unrelated to platform events? Hey, Bill. Oh, all right. <laughs> go, go ahead, Dan. Oh, no worries. Um, so I'm going to drop it down like 15 levels of complexity. Uh, so for, for me, it's coming up fairly often where um, a client will need a field that they that is calculated by a formula, but that they can still edit. Yeah. So, uh, and I sent you an email about that, and I got a, a really good answer. But I would like to, I guess, maybe see that in practice, what that looks like with a flow, if possible. Yeah, absolutely. So I think uh, basically you have kind of a field that you want to have a default calculation for, but you want to give the user the ability to override that should they need to. That's kind of what the uh, the high level use case is. I think so. Or, or possibly if it's left blank, it would get filled in automatically. That's another, I guess, scenario that would be similar. Yeah. Um, yeah. So let me, uh, let me show you how I might do that. Uh, of course, there's probably multiple right answers here, but let's uh, let's just jump in. All right, so I'm gonna go to an account. Um, and let's just say that on our account, uh, we're gonna have a field here, some kind of amount field, all right? Um, so let's go into setup. We'll go to our account object and let's just create that field. So we'll create something like a currency field. And we'll call this, uh, I don't know, account revenue, right? All right, so account revenue. And when you create an account or you're updating an account, if it's blank, you want it to default to something. But if they fill it in, um, you want to make sure that it just, you know, that whatever value is in there, just keep it. But if it happens to be blank, go ahead and populate it with some default value. Uh, so if you're going to do that in a flow, um, you might create an account flow. So it would be record triggered flow um, when the record is created on the account object. Uh, yeah, we can even put conditions in here. We can have that uh, condition here. So we can say that if the account revenue field um, is null, uh, that's when we would actually fire this. And we could even make this, because we're going to be updating just fields on the account, we'll make this a fast field update. Uh, so we'll say if that if that value is blank, uh, then we want to set the value equal to, set the value to default. And we'll say the record account revenue is equal to, and of course you could just type in a number here. This could be a formula field. This could be some kind of calculation that you do, but just for simplicity, you know, we would say that it's 30,000, right? Let's just say that's our default value. Um, so, so account revenue flow, whoops. Okay, so with just that in place then, uh, if we were to go into our account tab and create a new account, 
uh, and this is a test with a value. And I put in $40,000. Actually, let's make it something uh, obvious. We'll do like 999, something like that, and save that. Uh, what I would expect is that because, uh, let's see, where's our account field? Let's do a shift F5. Maybe it's a caching thing. Okay, because we entered a value, uh, I'd expect that value to be there. Uh, but if we were to create a new value or a new account, so we'll call this one test without a value, and we're not going to fill that in, and I save, I would expect it to be our default 30,000, right? So again, very basic use case where we're just putting a, a static value of 30,000 in there. But the, the main reason why you might wanna do this into a flow, I mean, we could set the default value to 30,000 in the field itself. But the main reason to do it in a flow is that if you wanna do some other kind of logic to get to, to basically get to that value, you could do that as part of a, like a formula um, or you do a bunch of gets to get related records or look up to a table of, you know, based on the state that that account is in, what is the default value that we need to multiply by some other field on the account? Like that type of complex logic, that would be the main reason to do it uh, within, within the flow. Um, so before I show one other example, does that make sense as far as, uh, you know? Well, I missed, it happened really fast, but that, that, event, that amount populated, that's a pre-save right? That, that populated before you even hit the save button on that, or did it already? No, uh, no. So if, uh, okay. yeah, if, if we made it the default value on the field level, it would be populated. Yeah. But you can see here it's blank. There's nothing okay. in there. And if we were to save that, that's when our flow would pick it up and actually populate it with the value. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, and I think you might be going to the other example I was going to say, which is what if, if uh, that rather than a value were like a, a field name copied from another field that if that, yeah. that was left blank, yeah. Yeah, so, and again, there's there's a lot of reasons why you might do it this way, but let me just show you that example. So let's just say that we have our, uh, we just created our account revenue field, and let's just say that we have a, a new field that we'll create here called, uh, make it a formula of type currency, and we'll call this uh, calculated revenue, something like that. Uh, this would be currency. And in this case, what we're gonna say is, switch over to advanced. We're gonna say if the manual field that we have, so the manual account revenue is greater than zero, then we're just gonna use that. Whatever's in that other field, use it. Otherwise, we're gonna have some other kind of calculation here, something else to determine. But again, just for simplicity, we'll make this uh, 888, eight, <laughs> however many eights I have. Uh, so we'll save that. All right, so in this case, then what you could do, um, you can have all of your reports, all of your other logic be built around that calculated value. So if I, uh, if we go over here to this without a value, um, and again, I got to do a shift F5 to do the refresh and reset the cache. So you can see here that we still can't see our field. So let me try that. One more time. Okay, let's, uh, one last thing here. So if we go to our session settings, let's turn off caching if it's not already turned off. And save. And then do shift F5. Okay, so there's that calculated revenue field. Now, I put in a revenue uh, of $30,000. So that's why that's showing 30,000. But if we were to go in here and just remove this, that calculated revenue is going to default back to the else in our if statement. And now it's 88888, right? So again, this is kind of a nice way that it'll have a default value. But if you were to manually put something in this other field, it'll then use that value instead. So, um, I think the main reason of doing it this way is that a lot of times you get into, um, you know, that flow should it trigger when the, the value has changed? Should a value, should it you know, trigger if it has a value, if the value changed? Like all these different criteria of like, when should it revert back to that original state? Whereas this is kind of cut and dry. It says, 
you know, use the default unless there is a value in that account revenue. So no matter if you put anything in there, it's going to override this. And then of course mm -hmm. this field, that's the one that you would use in your reports and everything else. Um, you know, so it kind of decouples the, uh, or it makes the logic a little bit easier. Use the default value unless you put something in the override field. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, any other questions? Anything else uh, you want to go through? I see a hand, Tommy. Hey, Bill. Hey. Um, yeah, I, I just had a question, uh, just kind of like maybe a proof of, proof of concept if anybody's ever done it before, but uh, trying to get a screen flow to launch from an LWC quick action. I'm yeah. wondering if that's even possible. Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, from a quick action. So just to make sure uh, we're on the same page here, you're talking about from like up here or the global action, or are you talking about like on a record itself? On a record itself. Yeah, yeah, we should be able to do that. So let's uh, let's jump into that. So if we were to go into a flow, uh, we'll create a brand new flow and let's make this a screen flow in this case. And just for simplicity, let's add a, uh, just make it simple here. So we'll call this uh, some screen. Yeah, some screen, there we go. Uh, we'll throw display text on there. Um, display text. Whatever. Okay, and then the actual text here will say this is displaying from an action. Okay, now this is the part where I'm just going to tell you that I have no idea if we can do this, but if it is possible, this would be the way I think. So we'll call this uh, <laughs> sample screen flow. And okay, so we have that. We activate that. Now, if we go back to our account record, I should be able to go to edit page, oh, wait, no, we don't want to do that. We want to go to object manager first. Uh, we want to go to the account object and under buttons, links, and actions, we should be able to create a new action. So a new action and flow is an option. There's your sample screen flow and uh, show my screen as a label and save. Now, just by creating the action, that doesn't actually do anything for you yet. So you have to go back into your object. You got to go to your page layout. Um, I always click the show page layout assignments button, just so I know which one it is. Um, so you click on that. And then under mobile and lightning actions, you should see that show my screen uh, button here. So we'll override uh, the default. Usually when I do that and I see all these things, I, I kind of panic a little bit and I've removed them all. But just for uh, demonstration purposes, I'm just going to uh, throw that on there. Okay. Save. And then when we go back into our account somewhere around here, um, just leave that. So if we go back into our standard account layout here, um, you have that show my screen. And if I click that, my screen should pop up. Okay. Because I was really, so, so that's great. And I think it may be a, a, a secondary because my thing was I already created an LWC quick action that shows a modal. Hmm. I was wondering if a button on that modal can launch a screen flow. Oh, interesting. Okay, so I, I kind of misheard you. So you have yeah, you yeah. already have a lightning uh, web component or a lightning component that is showing in a modal, and you want to be able to click a button from within your lightning component and have that display essentially another screen flow on top Correct. of that. Yeah, okay. and, and I don't know if that's possible. Uh, I've been trying to find something, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think uh, I think it actually is. I, I know for sure you could do it through Visual Force, uh, but for Lightning components, if I just did a quick search here, so Lightning component launch screen flow. It'd be funny if this was your question that was up here. <laughs> um, yeah, I know there's a lightning, is it this here? So is this an R component or a lightning web component? A lightning web component. And I've, I've seen this answer and I've tried to wrap my lightning web component in an Aura component. Yeah, that, um, you, that, that gets kind of ugly though. So let's, yeah, let's just see here. So under, uh, not this one. So if we go into the Salesforce developer site, we should be able to find Oh, this is going to be okay. Oh, here we go. Lightning components. And we should be able to get the lightning developer guide. Okay. So flow. F 
flow screen components. Oh, this is using Lightning Web Component in a screen flow. Um, you know, I honestly don't know. Um, I have to assume that you can. Um, I would have to assume that there is a similar kind of flow uh, you know, tag that you can use. Maybe uh, here, let's just jump back real quick. I'll give this one more second here, but there's no uh, there's no flow component here. Is there flow support? Input component to control flow navigation, notify flow changes, but that's not launching a flow. Target is lightning flow screen. Yeah, I don't honestly know, um, but that's one that I can I can try to give it a little bit more time and and see if uh, yeah see if I can try to create that. So essentially, lightning web component, click a button from in there. Uh, and have that launch a screen flow. That's what you're looking to do. Yeah, pretty much. And and maybe with what you just showed by launching a flow from a quick action, I wonder if I can do that just from a lightning tab or like a lightning page. Maybe that might be a lot easier than trying to do a modal and do a screen within the screen. Yeah, just, uh, it, you know, and if it's proprietary, you can't get into the details, that's perfectly fine. But what is the use case where you're launching the lightning web component and then from within there, you need to launch a flow? Um, so the use case is that from the opportunity field, uh, the customer wants to create a, a quote, but do if pretty much wants to be, have a one-stop shop to be able to not only edit the already opportunity lines that are there, add new opportunity lines, and then create a quote from after doing all that. So they just want it in one place instead of trying to click around a couple different ways. Um, yeah. and they're using the, um, the opportunity line, um, add multiple prod, uh, products, uh, I guess, uh, native action already from opportunity line. Um, however, I find it very difficult to try to just point to that directly. So it seems like we created a screen flow to mimic it, but now it's like, okay, we have these two different components. How do we merge them together to make it all in one place? Yeah. So the majority of your logic you're doing within your lightning component, and now you just need this last piece in the flow. Is that kind of oh, what right. I'm hearing? Okay. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Um, I don't know if this will fall in that category of uh, even if you could figure out a way to do it, like just because you can do a thing, should you do that thing? Right. So if you already have the, <laughs> the bulk of this in the lightning web component, would it make sense just to, you know, add that last little bit to it? So you don't have, uh, you know, cause then I start to think like if you need to communicate back and forth between them, that that's a whole nother, whole nother issue there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so yeah, I'll, I'll take a look and see if we can figure that out. But um yeah, my, my gut tells me that if the majority of the stuff's already in the Lightning Web component, it wouldn't be that much just to extend it to do this last little piece. Okay, yeah, maybe I'll uh, schedule some one-on-one -on -one with you. Maybe we can talk about it a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. And like I said, I'll try to come up with a proof of concept to see if uh, just, just how to launch a flow from within a Lightning Web component, if that's a thing. Yeah, cool, thanks. Yeah. All right, I see uh, two other hands up. Uh, Mary, you have a specific question or anything uh, we can try to help you out with? If you're speaking, you're on mute. There you go. Yes, I had to find the unmute button. Um, on a managed package, I noticed you were losing exclusive chart. Can't you use, um, uh, what is it? Our lovely schema builder? Or is it, or because of the fact that it's going to be off someplace separate and totally from your org, that is the reason that you can't use the uh, schema builder? Are uh, you talking about uh, like the what we we're talking about with the managed package with uh, platform yeah. events? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, well, you had the managed package, but you also had what looked like um, what you would do on Schema Builder on a Lucid chart. Was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Yes, uh, yes, yes. So the me, okay. So Schema Builder, uh, for those that might not be aware here, I'll just pull it up here so we can all take a look at it. Uh, Schema Builder is that cool thing that you can see within Setup if you go to Setup and then go to Object Manager. And then you got this uh, tab here for Schema Builder. All right. Um, this is really cool in that any object that's within Salesforce, whether they're your objects or you know objects from apps you've installed in your Salesforce org, they're all available here. Um, you know, for you to pull into this here, I'll even do auto layout. Um, you can see the relationships between objects. If I could try to find, here we go. So, you know, you can see this kind of spaghetti here, but um, you can see relationships. You can see all the fields, attributes, what fields are required, all that cool stuff. Yes, you can absolutely see that from here. The problem is that if you wanted to 
annotate this in some way or start designing objects that don't even exist yet, um, that's where it kind of falls short, right? So you can't put notes on this. You can't, you know, make changes to it or, you know. Uh, you can't you know, do a proof of concept or kind of. Yeah, you know, and, and this would be, if you think about that architect site with the levels one through four, I kind of consider this like a level four. You're at the very bottom, you're looking at individual attributes of an object. Um, uh -huh. So if you wanted to do diagramming that was at a higher level or that was a little bit you know, more uh, abstracted from what you see here, um, uh -huh. Schemi Builder wouldn't allow you to do that. That's where something like Lucidchart or you know, Visio or something like that might come into play. Hmm, okay, all right. Yeah. I thought maybe because of the fact that it was gonna be a managed package and off separate from your dev org or your org that maybe that yep. was even No, it's just, it's just the editability of uh, Lucidchart where okay. you can make changes and you know that kind of thing. All right, excellent, thanks. Yeah, no worries. All right, Steve, you got a question? I do. So <clears throat> I feel like I've been pretty familiar with flows, but I ran into something that uh, kind of surprised me. And that was the fact that um, working with a client who is trying to, they purchased another company, they're trying to, they, that also uses Salesforce. So they're trying to merge the two orgs and we're trying to figure out, you know, what happens when we break there, they use them very differently. So there's a lot of evaluation that has to go on about what happens when we bring the other data into the primary um, Salesforce org. Yeah. So we're looking at all these different objects and we're looking at, you know, uh, what triggers are there, what uh, processes are, are built in around it, all those types of things to yeah. see if there's gonna be a, any impact when we, when we do the merge. It comes to flows and I look at flows and it's got, if I look at record triggered flows, that's very easy. I can see, let's say for context, I can, I can see what object each record triggered flow is based on yeah. and that's fine. The problem that I've run into is how do I figure out which of the hundreds of other auto launched flows that they've got out there do are using contacts? Yeah, it's a good question. So I guess when it comes to like, which flows are going to be running off of DML operations on the contact itself, like you said, that's the easy one because you could just look to see that they're triggering it. But what you're talking about is, but what if there's something on account? Uh, and one of the account updates is called a subflow and you have some auto launch flow that's calling, you know, making changes to contacts. Um, I don't know if there's any way to do this within the Salesforce work itself. Um, but the first thing that kind of came to mind was um, if you were in VS code, for example, and you downloaded all the metadata from all of your flows, all of your triggers, um, mm -hmm. it wouldn't be that difficult to do a search within all your files within VS code for any references to the word contact. Right. So if you had an auto launch flow that was uh, being triggered from accounts, but it was then, you know, getting the contact object and doing all the stuff, all that, that contact, that API name of that object is going to be in the flow metadata. Sure. So that might be a way to download everything and then just search for contact. And that might point you in the right direction. Very clever. Yeah, yep. that might be a way. Like um, and I feel like I'm also obligated um, to show this is a relatively new thing if uh, folks weren't aware of this, but when it comes to finding flows or finding what's happening on an object, you know, all the flows related to an object. If you haven't seen this yet, pretty slick, uh, Flow Trigger Explorer. So if you click on that from your flow screen, you can say when an account is created and it'll actually show you all the different flows that you have uh, that run on that object. So it's kind of kind of slick. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah, that, that might be where I would start. Just connect to the work through VS Code. Uh, using that cloud explorer or whatever they call it now download all your yeah. flow metadata and then just do a search for the word contact or whatever other object api name you need uh, very same clever way to think about that that's yeah. that's the kind of thing i needed yeah yeah and same thing would apply for uh you know if you download every process builder process every flow every trigger um, and even workflow rules from within your org. If you had all that downloaded within your folder structure in VS Code, searching for the word contact should, in theory, find anything related to automation on that object. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. All right, cool. Um, any other questions? We have uh, just a few minutes left here.
Uh, any any quick quick uh, questions anybody has? Um, I feel kind of lame that I didn't do anything for April Fools today, but whatever. Try to get it next year. Um, all right. Well, if nobody has any other questions, uh, I'll hang out for a few minutes. But otherwise, thank you very much, everybody, for joining uh, for all of your questions. Um, I will be taking this and posting it to YouTube, and I'll share it within our group on LinkedIn. Uh, if you're not part of our group on LinkedIn, uh, please definitely join there because that's where I put all of our updates as far as you know what sessions are happening, when I inadvertently have to cancel them last minute, things like that. So, uh, and if you have any kind of follow-up questions, uh, please feel to reach out to me. You know, reach out to me there, or uh, you know, shoot me an email, and I'll throw the email address here in the chat as well. So, with that, I hope everybody has a great weekend, and uh, we'll catch up next time. Thanks, Thanks all. Bill.